Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the opportunity, Kurt. In fact, I want to start, well, firstly, this is a New Zealand accent, so I spend no time figuring out where I come from, but I live in Claremont, right? New Zealand accent, not Australian. That's very, very important that you don't confuse me. Um, but, but the reason I'm here is because Kurt and I have, have had a great relationship over the last couple of years, and a number of years ago, he invited me to speak to an executive forum about marketing in a recession. And I put together a half-day program for him, and I came away very frustrated that I, that I thought, well, what would I do if I was going to take a two-day program on marketing in a recession? And it's really because of that frustration that I'm here before you with a book. So I attribute a lot of that early insight to Kurt. In fact, he really saw... The, the impact of the recession coming, I think, and it was very, very early on in the times of this economic distress that we're in now. So what I want to do is talk to you about um, some themes in the book and firstly begin by telling you the motivation behind writing the book. This is my first book and I'm really enjoying as an academic, having spent many years writing academic articles, being free to write books. I think writing a book is a really neat thing to do. This is my first book and I knew I wanted to write a book but I became very riveted by what I saw going on around me in the September of 2008 where with the economy, the wheels came off the economy with a speed that I think most of us hadn't experienced before. The ferocity with which the, the financial markets collapsed Companies put their brakes on, didn't know what to do. And at the same time, we had President Obama running for presidency. And I found this a huge contradiction. In fact, um, a funny story along that lines is that I, I arrived in this country in 2004 when President Bush was being re-elected, and I couldn't follow your electoral system at all. I had no idea what was going on. So I was riveted by the election, not because I can vote, I'm not a citizen, but because I actually understood what was going on. So I was following you know, Obama and Clinton and you know, McCain and Sarah Palin. I was fascinated, absolutely fascinated. But at the same time, I saw this contradiction playing out in front of me. I saw President Obama giving a message of hope and hopefulness, and that was his platform that he um, campaigned on. On. And yet I saw people, uh, you know, colleagues at work, friends, parents of children that we know, feeling hopeless. And this great contradiction was playing out in front of me, the, fear, the, the giving of hope and the hopelessness that came with the economy and the, the fear that was creeping into people's lives. And, and being a marketing professor then, I thought, well, what am I going to do with it? And that became the motivation for my book. In fact, my working title was Hope is Not Enough, but the publisher didn't like it, right? So <laughs> I thought it was a great title. But so my, my title coming in was Hope is Not Enough because at the end of the day, we need more than hope. We need more than hope. We need, in, in my world, good marketing principles to guide us through this very, very difficult time. And even at the time I started writing, a lot of my data in the book was, was around that last quarter of 2008 into the first quarter of 2009. And, and if your memory serves you well, you would remember the, the, the you know, layoffs of tens of thousands of people at, at, at any one day almost in that first month of January. The fear in people that were wondering whether they might be laid off. Managers not quite sure what to do and being again embraced by fear and not, not knowing how to lead organisations and forgetting what I think is just good common sense principles. So that really was what infused and motivated me to write the book and what I'm going to talk to you about today uh, a, a set of 10 principles that are really, um, the book is themed around. And the principles are divided into two areas. One, three, two, three, whatever. I'll, I'll call it three. Well, three will do. Um, but the first one is just some principles related to the context within which we were op we're, we're operating in still. Moving into what it means to execute great marketing strategies and finishing with how we can generate growth through these really difficult times and trying to inspire, actually, by generating growth. So the first message here is quite straightforward, and this is a very Peter Drucker principle, so I want to start with Peter Drucker, which is where I'm, my, my school's namesake is. But Peter reminded us always to remember that the reason you're in business is because you have customers. Now I want to start with that, because right now I think some companies forget it, have forgotten it. And let me illustrate with two stories, and, and I'll, I'll weave a lot of stories into my talk, but whenever I phone AAA, and it's normally only once a year when I have to 
talk about the insurance premiums. I have a 17-year-old male driver on the policy, so you kind of get where I'm going with that. So, so once a year, I phone up AAA. Is there anything we can do to bring down our premium? You know, you, you may do the same thing yourself. But the way I'm greeted when I phone AAA is always, thank you for calling, and thank you for your, and my, you know, I've only been here six years, thank you for your six years, um, what words do they use? Um, thank you for your six years with AAA. I think it's as simple as that. And no matter what you're phoning about, you, come, you start that conversation thinking, oh my goodness, they know who I am and they value my business. And even if you were phoning to complain about something, you would probably ease off a little bit and think, oh my goodness, they value me as a customer. Second story, which is a different story, and I don't mean, I don't even know where you're from, so I need to be a little careful with my stories, right? But um, I want to use one about Verizon. Now I have had good and bad interactions with Verizon, and Verizon's a very large organization. But let me tell you a different story to illustrate the, the tension that we can face when we're interacting with organizations. About two years ago, we upgraded one of our computers at home, and we needed to update the modem. So my husband phoned up Verizon to talk about the modem and what we needed, and a gentleman on the end of the phone said, well, you know, it's time to upgrade, and I don't know the technology language, but the modem we had was a little out of date, right? So that's fine. So we needed, a, we wanted to get a modem that day, and the gentleman on the phone was talking about technology and different types of modems, and everything seemed, you know, helpful and reasonable, but then we found out there was a delay on delivery. And my husband said, well, how else can I get it? And the gentleman said, well, you could go to Best Buy, you could go to a Verizon store. But in the middle of that, he hit place order, right? So then the problem starts. And he said, well, we can't undo the order because I've placed the order. You're just going to have to not sign for it when it comes by UPS, right? So we thought, well, that's okay if we're home, right? If we're home. And it turns out the UPS didn't require a signature. So the, the, the package is left on the front doorstep. And now we have a modem that we don't want that we're going to have to pay for, right? So then the next round of phone calls, you know how it goes. You're waiting for 20 minutes for someone to talk to. And, and you, you're t ex trying to explain the problem. And you're told how to print out the return um, mail receipt things and put it in a box and send it back. And we did that. The next thing, it appears on the bill, right? And it didn't appear in one payment, but it was broken into three payments. So again, we phoned up and we're trying to get this taken off the bill and we're told it's taken care of, it should be adjusted in the next bill. And the next bill comes and two lots are on there, you know, and on it goes. But the point is, as a customer, and I'm probably not the best customer to have because I'm a marketing professor, right? So I know I'm very critical and I'm always looking at the interaction from the point of view of a customer and, and marketing principal. But as a customer, I had to do so much work to, to, to figure out this problem, and I'm going, what's with this? You know, and we spend a lot of money with Verizon, and as you know, we do with other providers, but you, know, you, you start coming away from those kinds of interactions wondering whether, there's any, whether they truly value you as a customer. And I think one of the things that's happened through the recession is that many marketing functions have been reduced, and I'll talk about that again in a minute, but things like customer service centers have been cut back because they're not directly related to the production of goods and people feel that we can just make you wait a little longer and we'd rather put resources into other areas. But you know, the reason you're in business is because of people like us and, and this is really important and yet I feel many times companies have overlooked that in the interest of cutting costs. Another one, this is an area that I, I couldn't help myself because I've already told you I'm an academic, right? So academics love data and I'm no different. I love working with data. And in this particular case, I wanted to have a look at what was going on with marketing expenditure through previous recessions to try and get some insights as to what happened post-recession. And let me tell you, um, you know, what, what, I was, what I did. I went back to 1979 and I looked at the, that as an entry point into the 1980s recession, which was the, probably the most comparable one to the one we have now, apart from the Depression. And, and I looked at that 1980 through 1982 period and I looked at companies spend on marketing and compared it to industry averages and I isolated out those companies that spent ahead 
of their competitors versus those who didn't, right? So, so far, so good, you're keeping up. And I was just trying to see what happened to those companies that managed to maintain marketing expenditure on par or better than their competitive set, right? And what I found, which was really interesting to me, is that those companies that maintained marketing expenditure actually ended up with a higher market value five years after the recession. And I thought that was really interesting. And let me tell you another story around that. When I look now at the data around what companies are doing through the recession and where the marketing spend is going, in 2009, marketing spend was down 9% year on year, right? Overall, all categories. What went up were things like coupons, right? Coupon spending, manager spending on coupons was up 12%. But things like advertising on television and stuff like that was down sometimes up to 30%. And I've got a colleague here from the newspaper industry, and I believe advertising in newspapers was down about 25% year on year. So certain sectors have been really, really hard hit. And we know that companies strip money out of marketing budgets through the recession. So what we found, what I found, was that companies that managed to hold on and maintain marketing expenditure actually came out of the recession really well, right? And I'll come back to that in a minute because I think that's a really important insight. Now, one of the things we know as managers, is, and this was happening prior to the recession, is that this is return on marketing investment, not return on investment, but return on marketing investment. The, four, the third point is that even prior to the recession, marketing had to be more accountable for money. When I started in marketing in the 1980s, you know, I could go into my chief financial officer and it wasn't quite as simple as this, but I'd say, look, I need a million dollars for an advertising campaign, and he'd say, fine, right? And we'd have a little discussion about how will you know it's going to work, and I'd say something like, well, I'm going to put some marketing research out there and I'll be measuring, right? We didn't have much difficulty as long as I had my marketing budget and I could have this loose conversation about how, I, how effective it was going to be. It was all good. And so, but now your marketers can't do that. We're in a different space now. We have to be more accountable. There's a lot of work going on in marketing about marketing metrics and demonstrating return on marketing investment. So this was happening anyway. This was happening anyway. But through the recession, it became even more prominent and we've seen a lot more justification of marketing activity. And that's partly why the couponing, as I've already mentioned, marketing spend has gone up on coupons by 12.5%, 12.9%. I think it is year on year. And if you think about it, what is a coupon, right? You put a coupon into the newspaper, we, we go and redeem the coupon when we're at the supermarket or wherever we're going. We can measure, right? We can measure redemption of coupons. Or if I put an ad on the television, an infomercial, and I have phone 1-800 now, there are operators standing by. And sometimes, I'm sure it's, it's not fair and true, but you have those little counters counting down on the television. And I think, how can they know how many people are calling? I think it's just, I think it's not true, right? But anyway, that you're made to feel that the first 200 and you're watching the clock ticking over on the infomercial and you get on the phone and you, you phone 1-800 and they can measure, right? They can measure. Or with websites, we can actually create websites, as you know, and we can have, we can measure traffic going to a new website. So the world of measurement has become very, very important to us as marketers, and especially through the recession. But the fear that I have with this, the problem with this, is it's taken us away from good old-fashioned brand building activities, right? And if, the way I explain this, if you think about something like the Super Bowl, right? Think about Super Bowl commercials. Hardly any, if any, of those ads have, I mean, imagine a Budweiser commercial, right? And imagine someone saying, phone 1-800 now, and there's someone standing by to deliver a 12-pack of cold Budweiser to your home, right? Wouldn't that be nice, right? <laughs> but it doesn't happen. They're, they're not, they're, those ads don't happen on the Super Bowl because they're all about brand-building ads. They're all about making you feel good about the brand, believing in what the brand position is, feeling that the next time you go out to buy whatever it is, whether it's beer or an Audi or um, you know, food, that you would go to one of the brands that's been advertised on the Super Bowl because you feel good about the brand and you feel that this is the brand for you. But that kind of marketing activity has actually been not completely killed off, but reduced. And the risk with that, as I've said, is that when we come out of the recession, a lot of these brands haven't had a lot invested into them, and they come out of the recession in a weaker position than what they were coming in. And we need to take care of that. So while measurement and accountability is important, as marketers, we also need to elevate our 
understanding of how finance works to be able to have a different conversation about the long-term brand building implications of our marketing investment. And related to that, you know, cash is the new metric. And I was reading in the paper just last week, I believe, that Standard & Poor 500 companies have between them accumulated $832 billion in cash, right? Up 27% year on year. So cash has become the new metric, which for marketers is a different metric to what we've been using in the past. As a marketer, when I put together a marketing campaign, I'd be looking at things like market share, awareness, um, sales growth, those kinds of key metrics are the ones I'd be traditionally using. But now I have to understand my impact on cash flow. And I think coming out of this recession, and if, if you're in a company that has accumulated cash, I think what's going to be really interesting to us as managers is to watch the merger and acquisition um, period take off. And I think many companies, many executives I work with are saying, look, we're sitting on a whole bunch of cash and we're just waiting. We're just waiting to see you know, that we have bottomed out and you know, we were talking just prior to this presentation as to whether we have another dip coming. We're not quite sure. But many companies are in a very strong position holding big amounts of cash and they will certainly eat up the week. I think they'll eat up the week completely. This is a really interesting area. I've got two slides that play into this, empathise with your brands. What's happened in the recession is that many, com many consumers stopped trusting brands. And if you think about some of the big brands that really let them down, you know, brands, especially in the financial sector, were, were ended up, you know, Letting, as I say, letting people down. And people became very disillusioned with corporations. You know yourself, the AIG type stories where the government bails out AIG and the next thing they're off having a $400,000 retreat in Los Angeles or paying out big bonuses. So there's been a lot of mistrust of brands by consumers. And yet we, we see also um, some brands have done some very good things to empathise with, with consumers and say, we are on your side. And some of the best examples that I, that I can give you, I think one of the great examples was Denny's. I love the Denny's um, stimulus breakfast. Do you remember that? After the uh, Super Bowl last year in February, they said, you know, come to us to Denny's. It was that Tuesday after the Super Bowl, and you can have a free breakfast on us. And the manager who was quoted in the media at the time said, you know, this is our, our little economic stimulus for American people. This is our way of stimulating the American people. And people flocked there, you know, they absolutely flocked there. I've heard from someone who knew more of the inside detail that Denny's had just remodeled their stores, right? And so one of their motivations was actually to get people back into the store. So it played multiple purposes. It was a very good activity on their part. It played into the empathize with your consumer um, platform, but it also helped bring people into the store, and I think it was very effective. Other examples at the time, that first quarter of last year, Hyundai and JetBlue, do you remember those two promotions that they had? If you lost your job and you just booked a JetBlue ticket, we would refund your money. If you lost your job and you've just um, booked a Hyundai car, I think they were going to pay the repayments for a couple of months, and I think I'm right in saying make it easy for you to perhaps give the car back. Um, other examples, Walgreen and um, FedEx, were also playing into the, um, the, the problems that unemployed, but the unemployed were having, and they were saying, look, if you're unemployed, come to a Walgreens clinic during the day, between 11 and 3, and we will help you. We will give you some free, free medical advice. FedEx, if you need to photocopy your resume, come to us, and we'll do it for free. So some really nice, very, very nice activities on behalf of brands to demonstrate how empathetic they were with this hemorrhaging and hurting public. We're here for you to help you. But related to that, I think another problem with that is don't mess up the brands. Now, this is a more complicated part, but, if, but one of the fears I have as a brand manager is that we have a brand and we need to be true to our brand promise. And let me illustrate with some examples of brands that do this particularly well. Disneyland. If you look at their brand mantra, they stand for fun, family entertainment. That's what we think of with Disneyland. And if we look at Nike, we're looking at authentic, high-performance sports gear, apparel, and so forth. So we understand what these brands stand for, and the challenge I feel with brand managers is, is you know, managing this tension between not messing up the brand and being empathetic with the market. 
Now, one of the examples, I, I sometimes end up Starbucks bashing, and yet I buy from Starbucks, so I'll just be careful with what I'm going to say. But, but Starbucks, to me, is a brand that's, that's in transition, and I think the recessions kind of force that transition. And if you think about it, Starbucks, people going to financial planners were told not to buy Starbucks, right? How much money are you spending on Starbucks a week? Oh, this is an area that you could cut back on, right? So, so already Starbucks was in, prob in a little problem space because they were being called four bucks and financial planners were telling people not to buy Starbucks. So they already had a problem because they were there positioned as a slightly premium, you know, upmarket coffee, a place, a coffee house you could go to to, to spend time with friends. So through the recession, as we know, they were starting to put instant coffee in, they were using that Pike's Place coffee and starting to, to really go cheap on the options for coffee. And you know, the question I have with that is, I think the jury is still out with Starbucks, is what it will become. Because I think what it was and what it is now are quite different. And I think you know, they're intentionally competing more against the McDonald's um, coffee market, the drive-through coffee, the cheaper, the Dunkin' Donuts type coffee. And they, they've lost a little bit of about what Starbucks was. And the reason I use Starbucks as an example is because they've almost been forced, well, you could argue they didn't have to, right? No one forces you to do anything, right? But they felt compelled to reposition slightly to offer cheaper options within the Starbucks portfolio. But the consequence of that is that the brand could end up being quite different, repositioned in the market coming out of the recession. So I feel we, we walk this tightrope between you know, staying true to the brand, not messing up the core value proposition of the brand, and at the same time being empathetic with our customers and, in Starbucks' case, probably staying in business. But there are other examples of, um, I believe, the Four Seasons Hotel chain really held on to its brand position in the last recession of the 1990s and they said no way are we going to drop our price. If you're a Four Seasons customer and you go into a Four Seasons hotel, you want to feel you belong there, right? If you've been a Four Seasons customer, you don't want to go in there and find a whole bunch of, you know, people wanting cheap holidays, wandering around the lobby, because you'll feel like, what's going on with the brand? This is different. I don't want to belong here. I don't want to come back here. I'm, I'm going to go somewhere else. So there's always this tension as you're trying to stay in business and you're trying to broaden and you know, maybe drop prices, attract a different customer base, that you could alienate the core. And I think that's a really difficult um, dilemma for us, again, as managers, is to, to figure out what we're going to do here. Moving on. Um, understanding the profitability of customers. Now, luckily, we can, and most of us have good data that allows us to figure out how much customers are worth to our, our organization. And again, I find this a really interesting story as well. Do you remember American Express firing their customers? Do you remember them doing that? They were going to pay $300 per, to each customer, certain customers, if they actually closed down their account. And American Express's reasoning for it is that, that you know, 11.5% of our credit card customers customers are defaulting, so therefore we need to make sure we clean up our books, right? They wanted to get rid of the, the customers that put them in financial risk. But if you, I, I love um, some of the columns in the LA Times, and Tom Lazarus, I think, was the guy writing, and he really got on the back of American Express. Boy, he was really at them, and he was quoting different stories of customers who'd been fired where you know, computer algorithms was trying to, were trying to figure out whether or not to retain the customer, and yet there would be, they'd pick up something that had gone wrong three or four years in the customer's history, and yet the customer was a very good customer. And it went you know, bad press on American Express. They actually had a really difficult time, if you recall, in the media where people go, what's with this? You know, what are they doing? Firing customers? What's going on? You know, I feel it was a very bold move on their part, because if, I, if, you're, if you can figure out the profitability of individual customers and you can't afford to keep them, you really have an obligation to do something about it, but it, and, and at the same time it can damage your brand by, ta by having you know, the wrong affiliations with different customer groups, but it can jeopardise the organisation. So understanding the profitability of customers is really important, being bold enough to fire customers if, in fact, they're not financially sound for you and also if they're of the wrong target market. Um, I remember reading a case study, something in the paper a while ago, about Vanguard, the investment company, that turned down a $40 million investment, right? Now, who'd do that? And the reason they turned it down is that their brand position was one of long-term, stable investment. They felt the $40 million customer was going to flip, right, be in and out of the portfolio within a few months, and they said, we don't want you. 
That's a bold, bold move, right? A very bold move, especially when times are tough like this. It's a very, very bold move to turn around and say, you know what? We don't want you. You're at odds with our brand position. We don't want you in our portfolio. This is a really interesting one. Be decisive. And I'll tell you a story to come into this. I'm not going to declare names here. I'm going to tell you in more general terms because I'm going to um, talk about somebody. When the, the crisis struck, a lot of CEOs and leaders of organisations, some of them completely freaked out. And you may have worked for those sorts of people, completely freaked out. And I remember being um, watching a CEO in action where he, where he was told to go and calm down his, his employee base. And if you think about it, you know, people were very, very fearful, and to a certain extent still are, but when companies were laying off and slashing and burning labour, and some of us have been in, involved in revising our forecasts and looking at what we call doomsday plans, like what will this company look like if we have to cut back 15%. Now, it may not have become our realities, but many of us were involved in making those kinds of, of plans. And so then the rumours start flying around organisations, oh, we're about to cut back 15%, right? Right? or we're about to lay off more people. And, and you know, I'm sure you've been in organisations just like this or seen it firsthand or heard about it where the rumours become more dangerous than the truth and people start spinning out of control about what's going to happen next. In times like this, you, know, you truly, truly need strong leadership. You need someone in front of you who can inspire you that he or she is in control, that they have a vision for how to get out of this mess. Now, the vision may not play out, Right? It may not play out because who knows, the, few, the, the times were changing, but you need someone standing in front of you that gives you a sense that they're in control. And I'll tell you a story to illustrate what I've seen. I saw a CEO stand in front of his staff and he was told to calm the place down, right? to calm everyone down. Do you know what he did? He, he put a PowerPoint presentation together and in the PowerPoint presentation he put artwork up of where the theme was calm and tranquility, art, pieces of art. Look, I love art, I love good art, but do you think that really is compelling to, start, to staff sitting in a, a room where he's just showing you pieces of art? If anything, it's elitist in my world, it's a little elitist that he's gonna start name dropping artists and looking at the color schemes and the, the, the composition of a piece of art. What we need to hear is what you're gonna do about it. You know, what are you gonna do to help us so we're not, you know, we don't lay off people People that we actually get out of this mess. Not, don't show me art. I mean, that's a little bit off, right? So, and the CEO lost his job, by the way. Um, <laughs> but, but yeah, the, the board found out. So, 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 you know, what we, we're talking about here, what I feel is really challenging for those of us who are in positions of leadership, we have to have a compelling vision, one that's credible, one that we can allow people to buy into what we're trying to do. We're all in this together, but at the same time, we really need to pay attention to our costs. Right? And so that's why I've put this contradiction there because you know, to be a really good administrator and, have, and pay good attention to costs, in fact I heard about an, a university who, in, um, and I'm not going to name the university but you may well know it's a private but not in this region, before the holiday season the president was standing up in front of the university saying everything's fine, we're doing well, now they have a $10 million deficit, right, in, in a few months, and, and he's lost his job. Um, but, but the point is, you know, he had no idea, or he appeared to have no idea that the, the institution was in such financial mess. I mean, what's with that? You ha even if you yourself are not the numbers person, you need a really good person up by your side that you can work with very, very well to understand the financial situation that you're in and understand what the decision, the, the implications of decisions are that you're making. You need them both together. As I say, just as we look at entrepreneurship and business startups, you, you yourself may not have all of those skills in one person, but you need your senior team to make sure you, you cover those two bases. Good administration, good sense of the bottom line, good understanding of the things I've talked about before, the metrics, the return on marketing investment, broadly the return on investment for other decisions you're making, and you need a really strong sense of where you're heading and, and what you're going to do to get out of the mess not that you've created necessarily, some of this is beyond our control, but the mess that we, we find ourselves in. So my ninth point is about Growth 101, and here, you know, one of the things that's sort of leading on from the previous point, what I saw happen a lot is this paralysis among leaders, and people freaking out completely, like, what are we going to do? You know, how do we get out of this mess? 
And so in, in the middle of all of this, I think we lost sight of what I would call good marketing, good marketing principles. So you know, where I'm heading with this, my next slide, I'll just give you a heads up where I'm taking you. I'm going to look at growth by generating new opportunities. But before we do that in a recession, I truly, truly believe that you have to do, execute your existing marketing strategy very, very well. And I'll, I'll come back to what that means in a minute. But the reason for it, when times are tough and money is scarce, it's very, very easy to jump off into any sort of entrepreneurial venture that you think might save you. Right? And you've probably seen this happening yourself, perhaps in your businesses, or perhaps you've seen other companies do it. And you end up in this kind of frantic scattergun approach where you're trying very hard to, to find the next idea to save the business. And the consequence of that, if you think through it, the consequences that you take money out of, of holding on to what the business stands for and why you're there in the first place, you take time away from focusing on the core business and the, the, the negative consequence is that nothing works, right? That you lose the whole lot, right? And, and that's my fear here, that I see so much diversion and franticness about, <clears throat> excuse me, trying to take care of the core, um, to, trying to take care of the business by, by shotgunning out and doing new things that I think the consequence is we lose sight of what we're there for and we forget what excellent execution of our current strategy means. So that's my ninth point. And, and the kinds of things we need to pay attention to are things like you know, simply understanding who our customers are. Well, there's an interesting point. You know, who are our customers? Revisit the assumptions we hold of the market. Spend time in the market. Make sure you're engaged with customers. Understand who they are. Understand what their needs are. Understand what would be relevant to them with your brand portfolio today. Because as I've already indicated, relevance can slightly change in a recession. Relevance can move. So understand who those customers are. And again, to quote Peter Drucker, as I've already indicated, as a market, we always start by understanding customer needs. That's our beginning position. What do our customers need? What problems are they trying to solve by interacting with our organization and consuming or owning or using our products? First place, understand that. Um, a lot of times we're in mature markets. I, I, you know, some of you may be in growing markets, but many times we find ourselves in mature markets. And if you think about what characterizes a mature market, it's, it's growth through brand switching, right? Stealing someone else's customers and or finding ways of getting you to consume more. I mean, there are two ways of generating growth. I either get, you know, as, as we find in phone companies, we, we generate growth. Excuse me, I saved a water. I've just been fighting a cold all week, and um, I'm just glad I didn't lose my voice. I was a little worried on Tuesday. I've had a busy week. Just one minute. Excuse me. And so, um, you know, we find ourselves trying to understand what customer needs are and figuring out where, where the customers are and, and, and trying to satisfy those needs. And one of the things when we're looking at generating growth in markets, as I've already said, is that we can either get growth by finding new ways to extract more money from you and think the phone companies. Phone companies aren't going to generate growth by bringing non-cell phone users into the market. And apart from our children when they grow, there's not much growth opportunity. The market penetration is very high. But as you know, cell companies make more money by getting more money from us, by trading us up, by putting data plans on our phones that we have to pay for, right? And, and so the revenue that they extract from us is growing. So that's one way of growing. But the other way, as I've said, is by brand switching. And how do we brand switch? We need to pay attention to brand differentiation, right? I need to give you a compelling reason as to why I'm different. Why should you buy from me and not stay with where you are? So brand differentiation becomes very, very important anytime, anytime. Recession's no different. But, but my point is that differentiation needs to be revisited at times of recession because the issue of relevance to consumers can change. So we need to really focus on that. We need to understand you know, who our customers are, what they want, what they value, where they buy from. We need to understand, you know, if those of you who are trained in marketing, all the decisions around product, price, place and promotion, if, if you remember that. Um, we need to investigate every single tactical decision we make and execute well. My previous dean used to call it blocking and tackling, which I didn't much care for the metaphor, but he, was, you know, he would use the, the expression of blocking and tackling when we're looking at recruiting students and bringing them into the fold. You just have to do it well, execute very, very well. 
But the other side of that is that we also know that markets do mature. So my, my primary message coming into this, I'm not encouraging you to jump out and look for growth opportunities before you've taken care of the core business, right? I'm, I, I just feel that's really dangerous at the moment. But my tenth point is that we still want to in, identify new growth opportunities. And we know that even in spite of... Um, you know, the, the, the current economic times we're in, we know that markets mature, we know that consumers, we have a consumer attrition, we lose customers, we know that companies and competitors do things to us that make us need to find new opportunities. So in spite of everything, we still need to find ways of changing. And I want to share with you something that I've, I've developed. I work in the marketing and innovation space. That's my love, my first love. And I want to just, for the final part of this presentation, just take you through a problems and solutions framework to help you make sense of how you can come up with new ideas for, for um, growth, right? So that's where I'm taking you now, the problems and solutions framework. And really my message is going to be a couple of things that don't get too caught up in marketing research. That's going to be one thing I'll talk about. And I'm going to talk to you about this whole problems and solutions linking. So, so I'm going to take you through four different stages. We've got problems looking for solutions, and we've got solutions looking for problems. And very quickly, I'm only going to spend a few minutes on it. I could spend a day on this. It's, it's really interesting to me. But I just want to touch on some of the issues we have and give you some, make you feel a little bit brave to go out and challenge the assumptions that you hold about the market. So stage one on the left-hand side, it's the, the kind of thing where we, we go out and we do marketing research and consumers say, look, you know, I've got a problem here. I, I clean my house with cleaning products, but I, want, I really want you to come up with a range of phosphate cleaners, right? Phosphate-free cleaners, I should say. So I go to the consumer. The consumer tells me their problem. I have a problem. I want to make sure I'm taking care of the environment. And the consumer tells you what they want. They give you the idea for the solution. They say, could you come up with some phosphate-free cleaners? You say, oh, that's a good idea, consumer. Why don't I do that for you, right? Let me do that. So the important part here is that the consumers can tell you what the problem is, and they can come up with the solution. Those are the two really critical parts here. All right? Second part is that consumers can tell you what the problem is, but they can't tell you what the solution is. For example, I might look inside my handbag, which is a little too small, and I might see that I've got all this, uh, firstly I've told you what a problem is, it's too small, and I might say to you in some marketing research, look at my handbag, you know, I've got a, a phone in there, I've got a camera in there, I've got credit cards in there, I've got, um, you know, pens, and oh, look at the mess in there. But I have, I'm not technologically sophisticated. I've got no idea what the solutions could be. I don't know that you can, you know, I'm making this up a little bit to suit my story, but I don't know you can put a phone with a camera. Oh, my goodness, a camera phone? What's with that, right? And I didn't know I could have the ability to pay um, for purchases using my phone. I know we can't do that here, but we can in Japan, where all of my bank records are sitting on my cell phone. I don't even need credit cards. So what's with that? So the point is, I can tell you what the problem is, but you're going to have to work with me to come up with a solution. And this, again, it's a marketing research, but, it, but the important part here, it's not just me as a marketing person talking to the customer. The important take away from point two is that we as a team of people within the organization should be talking to our customers because I will only hear marketing things, right? I'm only going to hear marketing stuff. I'm not going to hear technology things. I don't, I don't have a clue, right? So we need a cross-functional team to go out and talk to our customers and be in touch with our customers. So as I said, a well-designed survey should work, and many companies, again, if you're a large company, you're probably in the market all the time doing surveys and getting customer feedback, but if you're a smaller company, you might be frightened about whether you can afford to do surveys. You may be a little concerned about whether you have the expertise, the capability, the resource to go out and do surveys. But the point is that, that to be able to extract problems that will help you find solutions, you've got to give consumers the opportunity to provide you with feedback. Now, I'm not a great fan of Survey Monkey, right? I'm not much of a fan of Survey Monkey. And the reason for it, if you think about when you fill out surveys, and, and I don't mean to pick on Survey Monkey, I should be generically talking about online surveys, right? I, I, I use Survey Monkey as a generic bad, right? But I'm not a great fan of things like Survey Monkey because they don't really give you opportunities to provide feedback. Sure, we can ask why is that, right? But how many of you fill in that blank on a survey? You might say, because I just didn't like it, right? 
Well, how helpful is that to a manager? Really, how helpful? You'll get your rankings, you get your one through five, you'll see a little indication that there could be a problem somewhere. But beyond that, you're not going to get those rich, deep insights that you would from sitting in front of a customer and talking or watching them shopping and then, or consuming your product or sitting around a board table with heavy users of your product in a business-to-business -business environment and talking to them about the problems they have with product. And one of the problems I have, which is really the important transition here, is that one of the, the, the challenges we have when we're looking at these kinds of frameworks, we don't challenge the assumptions we have of a market. And let me illustrate with an example. If I've done a brilliant job as a marketing manager, and I've gone to the market and told the market, you need to be concerned about phosphates and cleaners, right? And then I do some marketing research, and consumers come back and say, I'm really concerned about phosphates and cleaners. Right? What's going on here? I'm really, is it, are you getting good insights from the consumer or are you really just getting back what you've told them? Right? Got it? And this is one of the problems I have, I'm, and I have to say I'm a marketing, I'm marketing research trained, but I'm also a little, I get cynical about methods, right? So the point is if I've done a really great job as a marketing manager, you're going to give back what I've told you. If I tell you that you have to va evaluate cleaners on the basis of whether they're phosphate free, you're going to come back and say, I want cleaners that are phosphate free, right? So one of the quotes I use that I love, and I don't make any apologies for the length of the, of the quote, I absolutely love this quote. It's from 1936, I love old quotes. This is, this is got, I've tried to underline the main things, but let me tell you the story behind it. The, the theme here is that when supermarkets first came out, this is with Long Island, New York, the Grocery Association, which you know, looked after the corner neighborhood stores, a gentleman spoke to an association conference, and he said, don't worry about the supermarkets. Don't worry about them, all right? You've got nothing to fear, right? And, and if you look here, people, what he's, he's saying, don't worry about it. People love convenient neighborhood grocers. And all we have to do is cooperate with our suppliers, pay attention to our costs, improve our service, and we'll weather the storm. Isn't that cool? Well, not cool, really, if you're a corner grocer. But I love the quote because it really illustrates my point about how we don't often challenge our assumptions about markets if we just keep going through this little rotation of asking you what you need and want, right? So imagine if I'm a, a marketing research respondent in 1936. I wasn't around then, by the way, but imagine I was. Um, imagine you came and asked me, how can I improve service here? And you said, well, I really like what you do. There's nothing more you can do. You've always looked after me. You've looked after my kids when they come in and buy. You've got everything I want. You deliver product to my home. You, I love you. You're doing everything fine. And yet tomorrow, a supermarket owns up, opens up and I have to go on a bus or a tram or however I'm going to get to the supermarket, and it's impersonal. No one knows me. But you know what? The range is better and the prices are a little bit better. And there I am at the supermarket, and I've betrayed my corner grocer, right? And that's what I find really interesting in this whole, when we, when we think we're doing ourselves a good service by going back into our customers and we're circling around and asking them how we can improve and improve and improve, the danger is that we don't challenge our assumptions. And, you know, these are a couple of things. A Hollywood move, I need to change this. They've gone out. They're out of business in our neighborhood, right? But again, I mean, look at these kinds of things and just think to yourself, at what point, you know, I, buy, I, I use Netflix. I'm sure many of you do now. I would never have told them this in a piece of marketing research, and yet I, I've changed my behavior. It suits me. You know, I, I, like, I like putting movies in the line, the queue. When I see it, you know, it suits me. You know, when did Rolex, you know, if you think about Rolex watches, at one point they might have, you know, we would have looked at watches and we would have talked about timeless quality, enduring, classic, buy for a 21st, buy for graduation, it's all good, right, it's all good. And then Swatch comes along, what's with that, right? All of a sudden we've got a watch for all occasions, different colours, fashion accessories, you know, and, and completely change our assumptions of what is possible. I have to put this, and when I remember when I went to the dentist in the 1980s sometime, I had one of those dentists that used to wear rubber gloves, but he had the same gloves on all day, right? Oh, I don't know, what's with it? He used to blow his nose wearing the rubber gloves. <laughs> I'm sure he doesn't do that now. That was in the first days of wearing gloves, and I think he thought as long as he, I think it was to protect himself from his patients, not, not worry about us. But I remember my dentist um, 
telling, telling us that off-white teeth were really healthy, right? If you had off-white coloured teeth, they were the most healthy and the enamel was the strongest. All of a sudden, white teeth are healthy. What's with that, right? So my point, with, and I could go on and on and on with these examples, but my point is that, that you know, things come into markets that shake our assumptions up about what should be and what, what attributes we should um, value as a consumer, and we need to be bold and brave to do that as we're looking at the recession. I'm just going to go through, oh, I want to exercise, okay, and a couple more, and that. Astral weeks, nice. Okay. Um, I just, I, I, in the interest of time, I'm just going to zoom through to here because I want to give a couple of minutes for questions at the end. But to flip it around, you know, where I find it more interesting is when you start with a solution and you go out looking for a problem, right? As opposed to starting with a problem and going to connect it with, a, you know, finding the solution from the consumer, what I find really interesting is when you start with a solution and you go out there and try and solve a consumer problem for them. In my stage three and stage four, I'll put, I'll put them both up and then I'll talk around them both. What to me is really intriguing is if, if, you know, if I've come up with an expertise and I have a particular competence in something and I turn it into a product, for this to work in the marketplace, I have to link it to a problem that's compelling for my audience, for my customers. And I may link it to several different problems. To link it to one problem may be quite difficult, right? So my challenge as an entrepreneur is to find a compelling linkage to a problem that makes sense to my consumers, my potential consumers. And let me illustrate with a couple of problems. iPad, why can't I use iPad, right? It's just out right now. So, and I think 430,000 some have been launched, and there are technical problems I've heard, but whatever, we'll put that aside. But, but the thing I love about innovations like that is that I wouldn't have necessarily asked you in marketing research for an iPad, right? I wouldn't have asked. And yet here's a technology-driven product that we're not quite sure what solutions it will finally offer consumers, what problems it's going to finally solve. Just as the iPhone before it, you know, who would have thought when the iPhone was launched into the market that it would end up doing as much as it had and, and solve so many different consumer problems that it actually has? You know, lifestyle drugs, like going and doing DNA testing to see if you may be predisposed to cancer or heart disease. I mean, that's another really interesting example. I wouldn't have asked for that. The other one that I find really intriguing is a new range of drugs for cognitive enhancing drugs. I mean, I'm, I'm at that stage of life where you can probably kind of figure out how old I am, but I have to write things on my hand, right? When I go into a room, I write things on my hand, so I remember what I've gone into the room for, but then I forget to look at my hand, right? You know? You with me? So I had a little problem going on, but, but I just thought that this little loss of memory was just going to be there to bug me until the, the day I pass on, that it, my memory would deteriorate, and that was just the way it is. And yet I read in the paper that now I can, perhaps if I wanted to, do something about that, because there are cognitive enhancing drugs coming out. So again, I may not have even talked to you about this in some marketing research, but the key for me is to start from the inside to come up with solutions and try and link them to compelling problems as well. I could talk to you for another hour, but I know that you're here until nine, and I've, got, I've left a few minutes for questions, and I'm happy to take questions, please. Yes, sir. I'll be honest, I don't trust my And good for you, yeah. But, but a little bit about ethics and marketing. Yeah. Uh, but, but for example, Boobs selling beer. You know, you know, we're selling products to, to customers who may not be able to afford it. Correct. Not the customers who may die because yeah, of it. Yeah, yeah. So, so Where do you, yeah, how do you sleep at night? Yeah, you know, yeah. I work in the life science industry. Yeah. And I did a survey of, of my students in the US and China as, as to who do you believe for information regarding drugs. The last entity that they said that they believed were, were the drug companies. And, and you've got two things playing out. Firstly, we have this phenomenon now called consumer-generated media. As you know, we look on blogs, we look at customer reviews, and we don't always know where those reviews are coming from and who's authoring them, but we trust companies less. On the issue of ethics, there are two ways I'd like to play it out. One thing when I start talking around this space, 
I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands, but some people in this room may not be able to park their car in the garage because they've got too much stuff in there, right? And I'm, not, I'm looking down, or I'm looking down. But the point I make is that, that you know, we're telling you you need something, we're trying to create demand, but do you really need it, right? And so this is the tension that I find we have in marketing where it, in order to generate growth, you know, to be successful, we create need and demand, right? And the pharma industry does this a lot with conditions that we may not have thought we had, you know, making it okay to talk about conditions and all of a sudden you're selling you know, a whole bunch of drugs. So, so, so my position on this is that um, you know, for me I have to choose those companies that I would want to work for and, and some companies specifically do things because they want to improve people's lives and they feel it's, it's fine. I would never, I like a glass of wine, don't get me wrong, but I would have trouble marketing alcohol and cigarettes, it's not illegal, but just as you say, I, I, I've been involved in marketing research where people who should be putting food on the table are, are spending money on products that we're encouraging to buy. So I, I personally have issues with that. And, and the other thing, you know, you, you, I could really go on about this actually, you've had a, had a little cord, but another one that really I struggle with, <coughs> excuse me, um, I was reading about the banking crisis and someone from Countrywide, excuse me, I just need to do water, one minute. Someone from Countrywide, the, the legal counsel, hang on, this isn't going to work, <coughs> excuse me, the legal counsel from Countrywide was quoted in, the, in Fortune for saying just after the um, market crashed that apparently a, a housing um, non-profit had come and spoken to bank lenders and said, do you know what you're doing? And what you're doing, look at these people getting loans, they can't afford them. What's going to happen when the mortgages readjust? And the legal counsel was quoted in Fortune as saying, it's okay because it's not illegal, right? And there were, there, I, I'm not quoting him verbatim, but it was a, a, a longer quote than that. How can you do that? You know, how, truly, if it's been pointed out to you that you're going to, you're, you're going to cause the sort of damage that we've now seen causing, but it's not illegal, therefore it's okay, you know, what's with that? So, so my answer really, I mean, you have a good reason not to trust marketers, but I think from a personal point of view, I think it's important to feel that you, you are making a contribution and you believe in what you're doing. Yeah. Yes. Um, when you um, decide a company needs a marketing plan, all the companies need a marketing plan, how far in advance do you conceive the marketing plan? And in this economy, yeah. um, how do you determine, okay, this is going to be for turbulent times, and then in this time it's going to be for... That's a really good question. It's a really good question. And I think a little bit depends on the company, the industry. Um, prior to the recession, a lot of companies would do what I call the front end of the marketing plan where they're outlining all the you know, consumer trends, the market trends, the industry t trends, the economic, political, social trends, and oftentimes they wouldn't revisit those every year because they simply didn't change, right? But I think what, what's really important to me in these times is to be able to revisit um, those core assumptions that you hold of the market, I think it's really important to do that. I think to revisit, but, but pay really close attention to what your brand stands for. As a, as a marketer, to me the brand is a mental model that the market makes sense of your business, that you make sense of your business, and stay very, very true to that and ask questions about relevance to, to, to um, what you're doing. So I think in these turbulent times, I think you have to hold sight of you know, company mission, brand position, but be prepared to be quite fluid. And um, yeah, it's, it, there's no perfect answer in terms of how frequently do you need to write them, but, but to spend three months of a year writing a marketing plan when it's all going to change, you know, what's with that? And I think to be bold enough, and some companies I know are very stringent with marketing planning processes and time because it's a resource allocation issue, but I think you have to be very fluid and be prepared to revisit core assumptions because you know, one of the things that's changed right now is what consumers value and you know, the, the definition of value has changed. And we see, you know, with consumers being more frugal, not trusting big brands, um, being concerned about sustainability issues more than they were before. I mean, these are fundamental changes, and we don't know what would happen when consumers have got money again. We don't know whether this is a permanent change or not. So you have to be really, you know, have that market sense and, sense and capability tuned in. Another question. Only two? Yeah, one more. <laughs> Another one, please. <laughs> yeah. Is that, is that 
Um, I, you know what? I, I take it two ways. I know of companies that have done brilliantly well by starting with a brand, right? It I think a little bit may depend on the, the company, the context, but a student of mine developed a multi-million dollar clothing range where he started with a brand and, his, and he built a story around the brand and he extracted a premium in the market because he had a really strong brand in the market, right? So his product ended up being, for all intents and purposes, no different functionally. I mean, he would argue differently, but you know, for you and I as a consumer, we may see no difference. But for him, he built it around the brand. Um, so I think you need to truly understand you know, the message that you have, that, and, and the brand embodies the message. And the way I explain, another way to explain it is, if I phone Apple up, I've never done it, but, but when I think of Apple, I think of an innovative, creative, problem-solving organisation. And I would expect all of my interactions with Apple and anyone from Apple to be consistent with that brand promise. And I would expect them to be hiring people who are you know, creative and happy and happy to be at Apple and willing to solve my problems. Without picking on anyone, if I phoned Walmart, I wouldn't expect the same level of interaction. It's not that I'd be dissatisfied with an interaction, but the brand promise dictates how I would expect to interface with the organisation. So for me as a marketer, I would say figure out what that promises to the market because it will help you as you interface. It will help you make hiring decisions within the company. It will help you make other strategic t decisions if you're filtering them through what it is you stand for in the marketplace. Yeah. It's hard to do when you're starting because the issue of relevance can change. You know, as if you take a problems and solutions framework, another way of explaining it is imagine a container like the glass jar Kurtz just bought in and imagine it's filled with a whole lot of problems and solutions. You've got the solution, but you're trying to link it to a consumer problem as you're starting out. And what you think it might stand for may be different. And you know, the Apple iPod's a good example because some people bought the iPod and used it for, a, for an external hard drive. Right? What would have happened if that had become the main use of an iPod? You know? so, so the different problem to solution linkage. So in, a, another way of answering your question is that, that you need to pay attention to, the, to how the product gets adopted and used because the brand story is one of relevance. And you may have to slightly retell the story as you watch adoption in the marketplace. Does that help? Thank you. Yes, sir. In the context of the clothing line, mm. Actually, he, his, his story was really interest, uh, interesting because he was using merino wool and um, from New Zealand, obviously, we have merino sheep station and he'd worked and realised the qualities of merino wool. So he actually had, he was starting uh, and he put it on um, Peter Blake, who's since passed away, a famous yachtsman you may or may not know. But he, he allowed Peter Blake to wear it in the Round the World Yacht Race, and it had brilliant thermal properties against the skin. It didn't smell too much. You know, it was a really good um, heat and cooling kind of fabric. So he actually, in his world, he, he knew he was onto a solution, an innovation around fabric. All right, but his, his challenge before he launched the product around the clothing line was to really come up with a compelling brand and the problem he was solving was people, let's imagine, you know, just like us, who would rather be out hiking than here today. I'm, I'm not there, I'm, I'm happy to be here. But, but you know, imagine you're sitting in a boring office job and, and you'd ra you, you have visions of being out, you know, walking a, a track for a couple of days. And so that was the brand promise. It was really much an escaping, an escapism type brand that if you wear this to work, and some of the clothing items were, you know, Friday casual type, but if you wear it to work, you kind of, you're, you're in love with this brand and the story it tells, and you can have a little escape because you're wearing your icebreaker clothing. So, so very clever on both fronts, technology and a really nice story to tell, a really nice problem to solve for consumers. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if you want to we'll wrap it up there, if we might, we've got some, uh, an opportunity to gather outside as we leave here, but we did promise 9 o'clock, so I think we Yeah, and it's, we have four past, so. yeah. Uh, would you please help me thank Dr. Jenny? Thank you.